What's up guys, Jared here. The critical reactions to Disney's Obi-Wan have been pretty mixed so far, and I'll definitely be posting a review after the finale next week, but until then, I wanted to talk about a conversation the show has generated among the fandom that I find particularly interesting. And no, it has nothing to do with Moses Ingram, or even Hayden Christensen's disappointingly absent face. It has to do with Obi-Wan, specifically his age, and the desire to make sense of this person turning into this person. Fans are devoting an awe-inspiring amount of mental labor to the cause of justifying within the lore that Ewan McGregor turns into Sir Alec Guinness after roughly a decade. This fan posits, quite melodramatically, that stress and trauma account for his accelerated aging. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. Some have posited that the exceptionally strong Tatooine sun has stricken him with silver foxdom, but no tan, I guess. Some Redditors have suggested that he was using a mass-scale Jedi mind trick at some point or another to keep himself hidden. It goes on and on. So what's going on here? All of these people know that this is a consequence of a movie franchise made out of order over many decades with different actors helmed by different owners and told on different mediums. They all know that the integrity of the lore often takes a backseat to production influences. They know that casting the beloved Ewan McGregor is better business than recasting or CGIing his face to be some kind of Guinness McGregor abomination. They know that the world is only as consistent as Disney's business ambitions allow it to be. So why do they find it necessary to believe that this man becomes this man? This thrust me down a rabbit hole investigating the nature of belief, which led me to the book Did the Greeks Believe in Their Myths? by French archaeologist Paul Vane. Even though no Greek ever saw or expected to see a minotaur, did they nonetheless believe that a king named Theseus killed one in a maze? As you can imagine, by the fact that there's a whole book about this subject, the answer is a little bit more complex than yes or no. And similarly, I think the answer to whether Star Wars fans believe that Ewan McGregor turns into Sir Alec Guinness similarly reflects the wildly complex nature of truth and belief. So do we believe in Star Wars? Let's dive in. Now, if people believe in something, then it's implicitly assumed that they recognize that thing as true. So let's start off with a perhaps odd but critical question. Is Star Wars true? Did Luke Skywalker inherit a lightsaber from Obi-Wan a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away? Did he go to planet Dagobah to train with Master Yoda? Did he fully enjoy kissing a woman he later discovered to be his sister and not even trip about it? Of course not. Through a historical lens, the events of Star Wars did not happen, and not even the most diehard of fans think they did. What did happen, however, is George Lucas wrote the script. Mark Hamill and the cast acted it out in front of the camera, Lucas sold the whole thing to Disney, etc. But what about the Greeks and their myths? Did a hero named Heracles actually slay a nine-headed monster? Probably not. It's much more likely that a Greek storyteller, such as the ancient lyric poet Pindar, would honor an exceptional real-life individual by crafting a story about their heroics that was so entertaining it would spread like wildfire. It was out of human gratitude that a real person was spoken of as a god or the son of a god, and this act of interpreting myths as altered versions of reality is known as euharimism. Or maybe this tale was crafted as a means to instill a lesson or instill a sense of morality in those that heard it. The Greek scholar Strabo, he speculated that Homer wrote the Odyssey just to teach geography. Now, to the extent to which the Greeks actually believe that these events happened in history is complex and varies depending on factors like education level, class, and social context. But keep in mind, this was before the authoritative studies of theology, physics, and history even existed, and the intellectual universe was strictly literary. So unlike Star Wars fans, some Greeks really did believe that the past didn't operate like the present, and a time where gods walked amongst men was possible. So from a historical perspective, we can say that Star Wars, like Heracles, the son of a god, is not true. 
But these stories can still justify belief because historical or scientific veracity does not have a monopoly on truth. There are, in fact, multiple programs of truth, and historical truth is just one of them. For example, if I say Star Wars, some things may come to mind that would ring as accurate, like Wookiees, Stormtroopers, Lightsabers, Jedi, etc. But then if I said Hello Kitty, or Bowser, or Master Chief, that would be a violation of what we collectively understand to be Star Wars. We all agree that Yoda being a part of Star Wars is true, and Cloud Strife being a part of Star Wars is false. Rather than relying on the authority of history or science, an idea can be validated as true by drawing on the authority of itself. If I said that the phrase, it's lit, means that something is cool, the truth of that assertion can only be evaluated based on whether or not it communicates that meaning in popular conversation. Or think about unicorns. Even though no historical record of a unicorn exists, we still know that saying this is a unicorn is true and that this is a unicorn is false. Something can be what Vane calls rhetorically true, and the ancient Greeks would deem their myths true in the sense that they were well said and worth knowing about, leading to a sense of authority that was granted by popular approval and adoption. And so paradoxically, by one program of truth, Star Wars is true by virtue of the fact that popular belief grants it that authority. So of course we believe in Star Wars, if we didn't, it couldn't be true. Contrary to the program of rhetorical truths is belief as a form of obedience. For example, if the church tells you that Jesus walked on water, then as the designated gatekeeper of what constitutes the canon of Christianity, the church has spoken a truth that Christians must believe. And I think this program of truth is particularly interesting in the case of Star Wars, because how do Star Wars fans determine who we obey? The obvious answer is we obey Disney, since they own the IP. A transaction took place, and even if we don't like the choice to turn Luke into a coward, the legally ordained authority has asserted it as truth. Or if Disney tells us that Obi-Wan aged so poorly because a shifty Jawa sold him a sus skin cream that turned him into Sir Alec Guinness, I guess we'd have to accept it as true. Or would we? Sure, a company can spend millions creating a CGI spectacle with characters, concepts, and objects that only they can display without getting sued, but is that why we accept it as true Star Wars? Because they are guardians of a sacred legal document identifying them as the authority? Did we really stop believing in the books when Disney decanonized them? What if George Lucas one day tweets, Ray isn't a Palpatine? That's dumb. Would his diminished legal status completely discredit our incentive to obey his vision of what is truly Star Wars? I can't help but suspect that the recent surge of prequel love is in part due to a nostalgic longing for a source of authority bound in passion for the world rather than cynical business ends. As Vane says, a world cannot be inherently fictional. It can be fictional only according to whether one believes in it or not. So when it comes to fictional worlds like Star Wars, sure, Disney can be the only ones making the movies and TV shows, but it's only Star Wars if we decide to believe it. Now, for what it's worth, I don't think that the fandom's acceptance of Disney's authority is a product of sheepish obedience. It's more like blackmail. Since they'll be determining the future of all Star Wars entertainment products, if we have any hope of ever enjoying Star Wars again, then we better get on board with their program and accept the lore that they develop because it's our only chance. Finally, drawing on Sartre, Vane talks about how truth can emerge from our imagination. For example, ghosts. They probably don't exist, but if we thought about them with the same frame of mind that we think about physical or historical facts, they wouldn't be scary. And yet, for some, they are. Or horror movies. Everybody who's ever been scared at a horror movie knows they're looking at images projected on a screen and not a window and yet they still get scared. And that sensation of fear, that truth of your emotions, is dependent on belief. Vane talks about how he's only afraid of ghosts because they don't exist. If they existed, then they could be studied, they could be measured, and then they'd be as interesting as a rock or a chair and would cease to be scary. 
But that discrepancy between physical reality and our imagination and the ramifications of entertaining the possibility of the imaginary creeping into the real creates a unique psychological phenomenon that can only be considered as true. And it's no different with Star Wars. It's exactly the impossibility of Star Wars' rich, imaginative world that makes us believe in it. Believing in rocks isn't fun. Believing in chairs isn't fun either. But to take the leap into the imaginary and believe in Star Wars while we watch the movies, while we watch the TV shows, while we play the games, and while we theorize about it on the internet, produces wonder and excitement. To believe in, quote, unreal things, to take advantage of the psychological benefits of doing so, is a historical constant. The Greeks did it, and Star Wars fans do it today when they willingly suspend concern for the historical realities and theorize as to why Obi-Wan has aged so poorly. We like to think of truth as binary. Something is either true or it isn't. But as I hope to have convinced you by this point, when considering something like myth, or pretty much the closest thing we have to a modern myth, Star Wars, truth is plural. That Obi-Wan ages strangely due to aging actors and production timelines is in line with a historical program of truth, while the notion that it's due to trauma, the Force, or sus Jawa creams is no less true, but just according to a different program of truth. Now this is not to say that truth is relative, or that my truth isn't your truth, or we can't ever hope to achieve any kind of objectivity because we should favor a plurality of subjectivities. Vain is not peddling rampant relativism here. Vain's main point in the book is that there's nothing more universal than two contradictory truths coexisting in someone's mind, or people wavering back and forth between two different programs of truth. Juggling different, often contradictory levels of meaning is humanity's most habitual way of being. Everybody who believes Obi-Wan ages oddly because of trauma is also juggling the contradictory belief that this is the case only because of different actors over multiple decades. Just like how there are some Christians who believe in Adam and Eve, and dinosaurs, or people who twist logic to account for Obi-Wan's wrinkles in the name of narrative integrity, but also want Amber Heard replaced in Aquaman 2. By juggling two different programs of truth, people inhabit what Vane calls a modality of belief, of which there are many. As Vane says, the truth is, the truth varies. But why is it like this? Why do we waver between programs of truth? Why is it, as Vane says, that the cognitive history of humankind is one of mental balkanization and divisions? What determines what programs of truth we hold in our head? Perhaps unsurprisingly, Vane concludes that our belief is dictated by our interests, and that all modes of thought are necessarily interested. The Greek physician Galen would tell his students that centaurs were silly and made up, but then when it came time for him to attract new pupils, his language would change to that of a believer because that was more appealing to the general population. It's the same as when a Star Wars fan adopts a certain program of truth when they indulge in outlandish Star Wars fan theories, and another when they're complaining about casting choices or directors ruining the product. So, do we believe in Star Wars? Well, ours is the same case as the Greeks and their myths. They believe in them, but cease believing at the point where their interest in believing ends. And it's the same with Star Wars. People believe in continuity between actors and decades when they want to engage deeper with that world that tickles their imagination. And once they've harvested all the dopamine from delving further into that rich and imaginative world, they waver back to the knowledge that it's just a product of production conditions. Ultimately, we believe in Star Wars because we're passionate about it, and this passion makes us tactically suspend the desire for a single program of truth in favor of other benefits that can be gleaned from adopting multiple programs. As Vane says, literature is the magic carpet that takes us from one truth to another, because only something as powerful as storytelling can incentivize us to juggle these truths. We waver between truths precisely because of our spiritual and psychological reliance on things like religion, politics, and poetry. And so we deliberately tolerate contradiction more easily. So when it comes to the things that provide meaning in our lives, truth 
paradoxically becomes the most variable of all measures. Be sure to subscribe to the channel for my full review of Obi-Wan next week, and if you want to chat about any of the ideas that I talk about in this video, be sure to hit me up on Twitch by clicking the link in the description. Right now I'm playing Dark Souls 3, which is the only Souls game that has thwarted my attempts at completion, so join me on my quest for sweet, sweet revenge. Also, I'm hosting a book club on my Discord server on July 3rd at 9 a.m. Pacific time. I'll be leading a discussion on this book, The Listening Society by Hansi Freinacht. I talked about it in a couple of other videos. It's probably one of the better philosophy books I've read in the last decade. So be sure to check the links in the description for the Discord as well as the Twitch. Join me for the book club. And as always, see you next time, guys. Thanks for watching. Peace.